Maureen O'Hara graced worldwide screens for an astounding seven decades alongside iconic figures like John Wayne, Tyrone Power, and so many others. She is considered the queen of Technicolor, but to get there, she has to decide whether to yield to the voice of Hollywood demanding she sell her soul to the devil and make some permanent changes to herself or remain insignificant. Did she? Well, let's find out while we also show you some of her rare photos. Maureen O'Hara was born on 17th of August 1920 to Charles and Marguerite Fitzsimons. She was the second eldest of six children and the only red-headed child in the family. Just like her mother, she had a beautiful singing voice and a face that was considered to be among Ireland's best-looking women. But unlike her feminine features, O'Hara enjoyed hanging out with the boys and partaking in boyish activities like fishing, swimming, riding horses, climbing trees, and playing soccer. She later admitted in her biography that she was jealous of the boys with the freedom they had and the fact that they could get away with stealing apples from the orchards. At the age of five, a fateful meeting with a fortune teller would change the trajectory of her life. The fortune teller predicted that O'Hara would become a rich and famous actress. Fortunately, the family believed the prophecy and were fully enthusiastic about the idea. O'Hara would also realize her affinity with the arts after performing a poem at the age of six. From that moment, she knew that she was destined to be one of the world's greatest. She joined the Rathmines Theatre Company at the age of 10 and began working in amateur theater. Her dream was to become a stage actress. At the age of 14, she joined Abbey Theatre and won the first dramatic prize at the National Competition of the Performing Arts. She would continue to be a prodigious actress through the rest of her teens and became the youngest pupil to graduate from the Guildhall School of Music. However, as she matured, she became increasingly self-conscious, and the extreme popularization of plastic surgery didn't help her case. Despite that, she continued to stay natural and give in to the demands of show business as she would later recall in her interview. I was staggered to read in your book that when you came over, first of all, the self-proclaimed toughest, toughest Irish last ever to hit Hollywood, <laughs> that they wanted you to, to get a nose job and change well, your teeth. They said that my nose was too big, which it is, and they said that my tooth uh, on this side was crooked and they wanted to change it too. And you and said? I said, nothing doing. If that's what you want to do, I will go back to Ireland where I came from. And they but said, I stay like I am. And I'm still here and I've still got the big. At the age of 17, O'Hara was invited to London for a screen test by Harry Richmond. They adorned her with a lame costume and heavy makeup with an ornate hairstyle. O'Hara detested the screen test and wished to return back to Abbey Theatre. However, fate had different plans when Charles Lofton, a renowned English actor, was intrigued by the ease covered by the overdone makeup. After a meeting with O'Hara along C to his business partner, Eric Palmer, he was thoroughly impressed by her nerves and offered her a seven-year contract. And and thus, the beginning of O'Hara's legendary career would commence. O'Hara made her screen debut in Walter Ford's Kicking the Moon Around. She just delivered a single line as a favor for Richmond, who helped her in her screen test. That said, she did not consider it a part of her filmography. Her first major role was that of an innkeeper's daughter in the movie Jamaica Inn. Though the movie was not well received, O'Hara's role was considered promising by the critics. Regardless of its success, the movie brought O'Hara into the spotlight, and her next role was alongside Charles Lawton in The Hunchback of Notre Dame for radio pictures in Hollywood. The movie was a commercial success, grossing over $3 million at the box office, around $70 million in today's money. The duo of Lawton and O'Hara stole the show. One critic rightly remarked, the contrast between Lawton as the pathetic hunchback and O'Hara as the fresh-faced, tenderly solicitous gypsy girl is Hollywood teeming at its most inspired. However, just after the release of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Britain got involved in World War II, leaving no time for luxuries such as filmmaking. Therefore, in consideration of the bleak future, Charles Lawton annulled the contract with Maureen O'Hara and signed her off to Radio Pictures. This sudden change of environment devastated her. It was Lawton who signed me out of the Abbey Theatre to make films with him in England, and my first film was Jamaica Inn with Charles Lawton. And Charles Lawton brought me to the United States of America to make The Hunchback of Notre Dame with him. Mm -hmm. And then RKO uh, bought my contract from Lawton, which was a very sad day for me.
After Notre Dame, she featured in John Farrow's A Bill of Divorcement, but the production became difficult for her when Farrow made suggestive comments and began stalking her at home. O'Hara, as much of a tomboy as she was, kept ignoring this for a while until she punched him in the jaw one day, which finally brought an end to this mistreatment. The movie flunked at the box office and was criticized alongside O'Hara's portrayal of Sidney Fairchild. Despairing that her career might fizzle out amongst other popular actresses, she pleaded with her agent for a role in John Ford's upcoming film, How Green Was My Valley. Fortunately for her, she ended up scoring a substantial role without a screen test, beating contemporary actresses such as Katherine Hepburn and Jean Tierney. She also developed a rather turbulent friendship with the director John Ford. Anyhow, the film was a commercial success and won 10 Academy Awards, boosting O'Hara's career after a series of disappointments. O'Hara was seeking a revival in her career, and this movie set her apart as a splendid actress, landing her a contract with 20th Century Fox. On the other hand, O'Hara also got married in 1941 to American film director William Houston Price. However, she would regret this decision for the next 10 years. After her honeymoon, she realized that Price was an alcoholic, and her marriage with him steadily declined due to his alcohol abuse. And since O'Hara was a Catholic, she couldn't bring herself to file for divorce as it conflicted with her beliefs. However, Price eventually realized the marriage between them was long over and filed for divorce on the grounds of incompatibility, giving O'Hara a breath of fresh air after 10 years of suffocation. During the mid and late 40s, O'Hara starred in a series of Technicolor films, accumulating both successes and flops. Technicolor was the beginning of colorized filmmaking, and though the picture quality was subpar, it was still leaps ahead of its black and white counterpart. Films like Buffalo Bill did well at the box office despite initial suspicions. Similarly, Walter Lang's sentimental journey was a success and even made the agents at 20th Century Fox ball their eyes out, but it was still very poorly received by the critics. Some even called it the worst movie of all time. Across all of these movies, one thing was common, and that was O'Hara's stammering beauty displayed in Technicolor. Her rich red hair, bright green eyes, and flawless complexion would earn her the name the Queen of Technicolor. In 1950, O'Hara was again cast by John Ford in his Rio Grande alongside John Wayne. From the very beginning, she developed a friendship with John Wayne and commented that it was very comfortable to work with him. Over the years, her chemistry with Wayne would develop to the extent that people just assumed that they were married. Two years later, after performing a series of redundant roles, she was again cast by Ford alongside John Wayne in the comedy drama the Quiet Man. The film grossed over $3.8 million and was both a critical and commercial success, but most importantly, it was her favorite in all of her discography. Favorite movie, my, my favorite. Of favorite all of, all of all. Of all 55, what's your favorite? The Quiet Over the course of the next few years, O'Hara's relationship with John Ford soured significantly. It was getting increasingly harder for both of them to work together. Ford constantly aggravated hair, and she couldn't keep up with his farsa. She would refer to him in her book as an instant con man. Regardless, her film career was still on the rise, and she continued making movies. She appeared as a secretary in the British spy comedy Our Man in Havana, as a mother in The Parent Trap, and as different characters in a series of other films. In her last film before retirement, she joined John Wayne again in 1971 to portray their chemistry as a grand closure to her career. John Wayne would pass away just eight years later due to lung cancer. O'Hara stayed by his side till the very end. They both related to each other on a personal level. Both of them had broken marriages, had contracted cancer, and had worked in several movies together. O'Hara loved Wayne so much that she went to Congress personally to get Wayne a Congressional Medal. The people of the world, John Wayne is not just an actor and a very fine actor. John Wayne is the United States of America. He is what they believe it to be. He is what they hope it will be. And I feel that the medal should say just one thing, John Wayne, America. She returned after a 20-year retirement in 1991 to star opposite John Candy in the drama Only the Lonely. 
And after a few films, she finally played her last role in The Last Dance, this time retiring for good. During her life, O'Hara never received an Academy Award. So, in 2014, she received the Academy's Honorary Oscar at the age of 94. Having completed everything feasible in her almost a century-long lifespan, she passed away of natural causes in the following year. She lived quite a remarkable life. From the fortune teller's prophecy, to accumulating a discography of over 50 movies to winning an honorary Academy Award, saying that she was merely a successful actress would be an understatement. She is one of the greatest of all time. If you enjoyed this video, there's a good chance you'll also enjoy the one showing on your screen right now. Click, enjoy, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. See you on the next one.